Good evening and welcome. It is my sincere privilege to welcome you to the seventh evening of our week of spiritual encouragement here at the Southern California Conference. This entire week has been an amazing boost of spiritual vitality that has encouraged us during these uncertain times. And as we've gathered together to pray together, to worship together, and to be inspired by some amazing speakers all across North America, I know that our spirits have been lifted and encouraged during this time. And tonight, we have some other blessings that we'd like to share with you together. One of the best ways to share in these blessings and to enjoy these blessings is by joining a prayer group that's going to happen right after this presentation. So feel free to join by Zoom, a place where you can give prayer requests and where you can be prayed for. There's also a prayer line that you can call in and, and voice your prayer requests that way. And there's a team of prayer warriors that are going to be praying on your behalf. Once again, I'd like to thank you so much for joining us in this week of spiritual encouragement. And we know that our prayer is going to be for each of us to become a blessing as we are encouraged through this week of encouragement. Navigating all 
And now it is my sincere privilege and honor to welcome our guest speaker for this evening. He is Pastor Keith Jacobson from the Carmichael Seventh-day Adventist Church. He and his wife Carrie have been serving in that church for over 13 years. And prior to this, they had served in other churches like Union College, Pacific Union College, and Upper Columbia Academy. They've also served in various churches throughout the Northwest and on other places in California. Pastor Jacobson and his wife are all about the mission of Jesus, and they have led in various local and international mission trips by partnering with their local school and through Maranatha International. They also served for a short time with ADRA in Nepal. And after 42 years of ministry, they are still passionate about the mission of Jesus and about God's love for humanity. And as they continue to share that story, they believe that God is still present, still leading, still speaking to us, saying, don't be afraid. And now, without further ado, it is my sincere privilege to welcome our speaker for today, Pastor Keith Jacobson. Remember the time of guests coming over to your place? The extra unplanned for people who showed up at church Maybe your kids invited them home. Growing up, it was always my dad who would somehow manage to find the people visiting and invite them home. The only challenging part about it is that he usually didn't tell my mom that he'd invited people home until they were driving from the church to the house. And then Harley would simply say, oh, by the way, Ann, the people behind us, following us, they're coming to our house for lunch. Do you have a go-to in your home, one of those right-at-the-moment meals that you can prepare when that unexpected guest shows up? For some people, it's tacos. They keep those shells in the pantry, refried beans, they can put them together. Then, of course, there is that Adventist classic, haystacks. Some of you may keep the pasta in your pantry ready for any extra guest that comes along. That's one of the things that Carrie and I have. A few years ago, we made our own pasta sauce. Challenging thing about it is Carrie and I like spices. So sometimes we serve it up to that new guest. For some reason, they don't come back again. But we love the spicy sauce. Do you have a go-to? I think most of us do. That one item we can always turn to and say, you know, if someone shows up, we know we're going to have something to share with them at the drop of a hat. Church, it seems that right now, you and I are living at a time when we need to have a go-to faith. A faith that says, no matter what's going on in our world, I have a story, I have a connection that can encourage your heart. So my question for us this morning is, do you have a faith go-to? Growing up, I understood that my mom battled depression from time to time. It was not a clinical depression. Her depression was really seasonal, and it had to do with her battle with cancer. Her go-to was pretty simple. She would sit down at a day when she realized that she was battling the sense of being overwhelmed, and she would start to write a list of her blessings. She would sit down, begin writing, and honestly, friends, her list would start out slow, but the more that she started to focus on what God had been doing, what God is currently doing, the list would grow, and she would move from one page to another to another. So today, church, we need some clear go-to expressions and dialogues. In your home right now, when you're at distance from your friends, your co-workers, I need to ask you, what are you talking about? When you're walking around the neighborhood, what are you sharing? 
What is so funny is to listen to people talk about their Zoom meetings. Dogs and kids suddenly in the background when there's an important board meeting going on. There are even those comical stories of people being dressed appropriately from waist up, but if the camera ever goes back, suddenly you realize that person who has the dress blouse or the dress shirt is actually still in their pajamas. No doubt about it, life is different. So right now, let's talk about our faith's go-to. One of my favorite go-to passages is Romans chapter 8. I'm sure you'll recognize these verses because I'm sure for many of you, this is probably one of your go-to faith statements as well. Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 38. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I, I think one of the things I really love about that is really that last line that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. God, Jesus, who walked with us, is still walking with us today. The glory of the gospel story is that God loved us so much that He sent His only begotten Son to live with us, to redeem us, to assure us that we are not alone. It's one of my favorites. I believe this passage and this theme has been encouraging Christians down through the ages. A few years ago, a good friend of ours took us sailing out to Catalina. We anchored in Cat Harbor right across from Two Harbor. And I watched him set the anchor, paying, out, uh, paying close attention to him how much line he was setting out. The anchor was set, and our bow was facing the shoreline as we settled in for a solid night's rest while the water was simply lapping against the hull. In the morning, I got up early, expecting to go up to the bow and look to the land once again. But during the night, the tide had shifted, the boat had rotated, and now we were facing back out to sea. But friends, while everything else had shifted, the anchor never moved. So many things can adjust and change in our lives, but you and I need some very solid anchor points. This passage, God offers us this assurance that while there's so much that is changing and adjusting, honestly, I'm having a hard time keeping up with the new health requirements that are being released every single week. It seems like we get one pattern of worship down and we change it. We get one pattern of doing work and we change it. There are so many things that are being adjusted. Many of us are getting quite exhausted. We're exhausted emotionally, some physically. And what really concerns me right now is that maybe even some of us have grown just a little bit exhausted spiritually. So I want us to consider that this passage has come to us repeated and embraced by generations of believers. This passage is, is stained with the blood of martyrs. It, it has the agonizing grip of parents who have sat by their diseased child. It has the spiritually exhausted believer's tears staining its words and its promise. This passage shared in the apostolic church, has traveled even down to today. What was first offered to the early church is offered to the church today. Think about the nothings. You know, the nothings that can separate us? Like the plagues of old Europe. 
nothing like the great wars, nothing like the social tearing of today, the economic downturns, the divisions in church, country, and sometimes even in our homes. When our hearts are stressed to the point of breaking within, we need to hear this. We need to hear our go-to. I am convinced that nothing will separate us. Do you have a go-to today? In the face of the confusion, in the face of the agony, in the face of the things that would deplete you, do you have a spiritual go-to? I am convinced nothing will separate us. The author of this passage has come to this conclusion by a unique journey. The early church was uniquely best by the very bold and powerful expression of the Apostle Paul. In 2 Corinthians, he, he declares his own experience that, that candidly, friends, when I read the list of the things that he went through, I find it exhausting. And so did Paul. But Paul lists all the challenges that he was confronted with as declarations that none of those things, the whole collection of wounding going on in his own, po- own body would not separate him from God. L- listen to this. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I've been in prison more often. I've suffered terrible beatings. Again and again, I almost died. Five times the Jews gave me 39 strokes with a whip. Three times I was beaten with sticks. Once they tried to kill me by throwing stones at me. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have had to keep on the move. I have been in danger from rivers. I have been in danger from robbers. I have been in danger from people from my own country. I have been in danger from those who aren't Jews. I have been in danger in the city, in the country, at the sea. I have been in danger from people who pretend they were believers. I have worked very hard. Often I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have even gone without food. I have been cold and naked Besides everything else, every day I'm concerned about all the churches. It's a very heavy load. If anyone is weak, I feel weak. If anyone is led into sin, I burn on the inside. If I have to brag, I will brag about the things that show I am weak. It seems as if Paul is simply saying, I'm not strong in those episodes, but my God is strong with me in those episodes. He declares his weakness. He doesn't hide from it, church. He acknowledges that he's weak. He acknowledges that there are times when he would have been disappointed or, yes, even distressed. When we read this list, very real issues, We have a go-to declaration. Nothing will separate us. We have an absolutely stunning context. Nothing as in nothing. What is new to us is not new to God. God is not taken by surprise by all that we face. Our truth today draws us so fully to these stories and these passages. The very real trauma of life. There are horrors There are abuses, there are neglects, there are things that are unfair and brutal. Paul does not hide the truth that he's been a victim. His body bears the scars and the marks. It's clear by the list that he has even a mental record of every episode. When we tell the stories of God's intervention or sustaining presence in our past lives, we are reminding ourselves and our circle of listeners that whatever new stuff we face, we will not be alone. What are we to do? We are to pursue our go-to faith with statements, 
that have that are honestly faithfully and expectantly i, I want to talk about this idea of an honest faith i've been concerned at times about the christian who pretends or suggests that nothing bothers them I even heard a story some time ago of a Christian mother, a truly godly woman who wanted to demonstrate such a powerful faith that whenever she was sad, whenever she would cry, she would actually go into the bathroom, turn on the faucet, let the water run so that her family could not hear her weep. Years later, her children came to her with the expression, Mom, we will never be able to have your faith. You never cried. You never wept. You were always strong. Sometimes, church, what you and I need to do is have this honest expression of weeping. I, I, I don't see Paul hiding the truth. He says that he was beaten. He says that he was hungry. Sometimes what we need in our community today, and maybe that's the edginess that's made it awkward the last few weeks, is that we've been openly honest about the things that have hurt, the things that have separated. And the conversations have not all gone well. But we do need to be a people, especially in the church, that can speak honestly. And of course, in the context of this passage, we need to speak faithfully. One of the faithful ways that we speak is to recount how God has blessed us in the past. If you are locked at home with your family, you can't work in the office, the kids can't go to school, and you're wondering, what do we do today? You might consider making a, an encouragement book. However you want to engage your children or your spouse or your friends, start making a collection of how God has blessed you in the past. I believe, just like my mom discovered, when we start writing, we start creating, the Holy Spirit pours out on us and reminds us of the things that God has done in the past. I am sure that God has blessed you, and I'm sure that as you start to tell your stories, you'll add to it. You'll be able to faithfully express what God has done for you in the past. And when you acknowledge His presence in the past, this gives you... Huh, the ability to look forward, to expect, to, to live with an anticipation that God is going to do more. Some years ago, I think probably when I was in college, I was introduced to the last five chapters of the Great Controversy. And in there, I read, as most of you have read, the closing scenes of earth's history and the coming of God's kingdom. What is so clear as I read that story is that while humanity can no longer manage, while governments can no longer organize, there is the Spirit and the presence of God who is with us to the very end. I have an expectation, not in humanity, but I have with you an expectation in God. I expect that the God who has blessed the church in the past will bless the church in the present. I expect that the God who has been with me, been with you in the past, will be with us now. It's so different, isn't it? There, there, there are terribly painful scenes that are happening. You and I have family members and friends who are in the hospital and we can't visit them. We have end-of-life stories that no longer have the, the traditional collection of family and friends coming by, praying and, and singing together, reminding everything is at distance. So much of our former story seems to have been taken away from us. But I want to go back to Romans chapter 8, and I want to, to end with this powerful expression. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. No, you and I get to say it in the face of the things that would rob us of joy, rob us of expectation, rob us of encouragement. No, 
despite all these things. And church, isn't it true that there are so many things that are frustrating, that, that are exhausting? I'm weary of this. I, I'm weary of preaching in an almost completely empty building. I, I'm weary of, of not having that Sabbath morning community. My heart misses that communal worship, the visiting in the lobby, the, 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 the talking before service and after service. We have been created by God as relational human beings. So in the absence of that, this is the one thing that the current situation cannot, must not take away from us. It is that we have the overwhelming victory. Overwhelming victory. Today is not like I would like it to be. We've put together puzzle pieces in so many of our worship services. Most of us are doing at-distance worship. Except in this one point, it is not at distance, it is intimate, it is personal. The victory of Christ Jesus, your Lord, who declares to you that there is nothing in this world that will separate you from His love. I pray for myself, I pray for you, and, and, and I hope that you're praying for me that we will be encouraged by this truth, this overwhelming victory in Christ Jesus our Lord is ours. It heals us, it redeems us, and it gives us the freedom to look forward with great expectation. That's my go-to, and I pray it's yours. So go to your neighborhood, go to your family, go to your friends with this glorious victory in Jesus, your Lord. Heavenly Father, we want to bring to you our disappointments, our weariness, our exhaustion. We bring to you our questions. We bring to you our confusion. We, we lay it all before you right now. It, it, it is not a, a wonderful set of gifts. It is our confession. It is our openness. It is our declaration that we are needing you to be God, to be present, to heal. We pray that you would take the words of this promise and fulfill them in our lives. For there have been times in the last few months when some of us, many of us, have felt a unique separation from family, from friends, from community. Maybe even there have been some who have felt a separation from you. So restore, empower, be present, be that victorious Jesus once more. In your holy name. Amen. Hey, church family. How are you? It's Matthew Bologna, um, Glendale Filipino church youth pastor. Um, I wanted to have share a little bit of encouragement with you this week. Um, it has definitely been an interesting, interesting time that we've all gone through. But I could definitely say that the Lord has been leading and moving in my life in powerful ways and in my community's life. I could tell so many stories about how we have so many elderly folks in our uh, Zoom room meetings. I could tell you how our young adults are taking the foreground and really stepping up to the plate. But I'd rather share with you something a little bit more personal. Uh, my dad's text that he's put on me is, is Philippians 3, 13 and 14. It says, uh, don't look to the things in the past, but reach forward and cling towards that high mark, the high calling, your high calling in Jesus Christ. Knowing that if you're spiritually mature, I think if you keep on reading on, it shares that those of you that are spiritually mature, now that you found this, new opportunity to walk with Christ and it's now our responsibility
to do mentorship and discipleship with the younger generation. So I look forward to walking with you and uh, to being the best pathfinder I possibly can be, to go up new trails and adventures and uh, discover what the Lord has in store for us and our young people. I want you to stay encouraged to know that we're out here and the, we're listening to the Lord's voice and we're listening to him very closely and we're following him wherever he goes. So rest assured, church family, the Lord is going to new thing. And it says in the last days, your sons and daughters will prophesy. And let's not be scared anymore of what that means. Uh, the Lord is going to open up and pour his Holy Spirit into us and into our community. And it's going to be an amazing time for those of us that are spiritually mature because we'll realize we have to get our own homes and our houses in order. So it's my prayer and plea that we continue on and bind together and be that one house. Really show other people what it's like to be connected in spirit and in truth. So much love, peace, solidarity, and hang loose. Take care, church family. I'd like to thank Pastor Keith Jacobson for such an encouraging message. I know that he was a blessing to so many of us out there here at the Southern California Conference. And I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight. We want to invite you back tomorrow because we have another day that is jam-packed with blessings that we would like to share with you that we know that are going to be a big encouragement to you. So join us tomorrow again at 6 p.m. And there's going to be another opportunity for you to share prayer concerns and for the prayer team to pray with you. So make sure that you stay online so that we can join that Zoom group. It'll be open from now over the next 15 minutes. Once again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you've been encouraged. And now that you've been encouraged, go and share that blessing of encouragement with someone new. Do you need special prayer tonight? Well, our Southern California Conference prayer team is in our virtual prayer room right now. And you can join on Zoom using the meeting ID and passcode on your screen, or just simply call in on your phone using the phone number and access code you see on your screen.